What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on the Soren Baker Show. Thank you for tuning in. You know, I'm a longtime rap fan and a overall entertainment fan and been loving the career that I've been able to establish here, man, and to have my own podcast is a, a amazing feeling. And it's a, another amazing feeling for the debut show to launch it off with one of my favorite artists of all time, man. Cocaine is in the building, a.k.a. Who Am I from back in the day, for uh-huh. those that uh, dig in the crates like that, man. But uh, thank you for coming through for the for the debut show, Cocaine. Appreciate my it. My pleasure, as always, fam. Yeah, Real yeah. Talk. So... What we're going to do here is go through uh, a lot of his uh, career and discography. We can't do the whole thing because we only got we got less than an hour for the show tonight. And he is the most featured artist in the world, if not one of the most. I don't know about the whole world. All right. That's the branding, though. Right. But uh, the amazing thing is that cocaine, for those that don't know, has been in the game for so long and has worked with so many different artists and had such a huge influence and impact with so many people and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight we're going to go relatively chronologically speaking so that people can get the breadth and the depth and really understand what's going on so so cocaine for you uh i wanted you to also to start this off by explaining and documenting your relationship, family ties, and everything with Co-187, Big Hutch. Because in my new book, The History of Gangster Rap, which I interviewed you for and interviewed Hutch for, you know, I think it's important to understand the legacy of what Law House, Above the Law, and what you guys um, created, innovated, and brought to the game. Right. So let's start off with the family relationship between you and Hutch first. Well, Hutch is my cousin. Mm-hmm. You know, he was named after Willie Hutch. Yes. You know, rest in peace. Right. You know, Willie Hutch was one of the greatest musicians. Absolutely. Around. And, um, you know, music has always been in our household. I mean, it was imperative that we were going to do music. Right. And back when Hutch was doing his thing in the early 80s, mid 80s, you know, I was following behind him because at the same time, we both come from a musical background. You know, my dad was a part of the Funk Brothers. He had hundreds of uh, musical compositions as an arranger, writer, and composer. And uh, it was just second nature. You know, the apple fell off the tree. And back in those days, you know, it was a revolution. I call it a revolution of different varieties of music, mm-hmm. you know, from the period of the late 60s and 70s, uh, 80s. You know, it had a big impression from hip hop first coming around to all our, you know, funk fathers, you know, that, you know, it was it was just like a big pot of gumbo. Right. So it stuck to me like glue. And, you know, I used to see Hutch do a lot of talent shows itself, do a lot of shows. Mm-hmm. And that inspired me just as well as coming from a musical background to be able to say, okay, I really want to make a career out of this, you know, at a youth mm-hmm. and with hip hop having, you know, pop locking and breaking, you know, I was telling somebody the other day, man, I've been around since the radio trying, right. you know what I mean? So it was just something that, um, that really had a major influence on me. So I've always, um, been an artist, the type, the type of artist to like to rap and sing, mm-hmm. you know, I wanted to be the rich little, Mm. of of the game when it comes to soul okay and emulating those sounds so you know that's why we're here and you know meeting cats like Laylaw, who was a contributing member of nwa absolutely you know when they got signed you know hutch kept his promise i you know i love him for that Mm -hmm. because they could have did anything you know right but he said once i get my opportunity and shine i want to take you along with me because i can pull some treasure out of you right you know, sometimes you need that. You know, you need your Phil Jackson to a Jordan. Of course. And he was my Phil Jackson. Mm-hmm. And when he, you know, got signed, was first building a relationship with Laylaw in 88. And then 89, you know, we did a three-song demo. Laylaw heard it. You know, uh, Hutch recorded it in Pomona, California. Shot the the songs to Easy e 
And it didn't take that long for me to get signed, mm -hmm. you know. I was different. I brought something different, especially Absolutely. with a name like Cocaine. Yeah. You know, you had NWA, which was considered <laughs> uh, the the most controversial name right. for artists. But then you had Cocaine, which is the most controversial name in the game. Mm -hmm. And we just wanted to represent, you know, that when you hear our music and funk, you know what I'm saying? You're going to get hooked. Right. So that was my humble surroundings right there, you know. And with Hutch, obviously keeping his word, being your cousin and everything, but beyond that, of course, you're getting put into the game and you're with Easy e you're with Dr. Dre, you're right. around this movement with Laylaw that's doing these enormous things. Um, and one thing that I've always thought was interesting about it you know, I grew up in Maryland, so I'm not from Los Angeles originally. Right. And I didn't understand uh, Pomona being so far away from L.A. Like, I thought as a uh -huh. kid that it was relatively close and that, um, you know, it was more like an Englewood or a Watts or South Central. So did you, what did you guys find or was there any impediments that you guys had being a little bit further, like 40 miles away instead of four well, see, that was that was um, that was in the, in that section mm -hmm. because we L.A. County. That's right. the last the city last before you turn into the Inland Empire. Okay. So a lot of people used to come to the L.A. County fairgrounds from Uncle Jam's Army, right? To Egyptian Lover, uh, to Bobby Jimmy and the Critters, Rock Him, Your Who's Who. You know that was back in the McCullough days. So a lot of the McCullough artists you know, used to come out there, or Rainbow Records, or, you know, from New York all over. So Pomona was definitely a significant fact, a significant part of really, you know, um, putting people on the map out there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We was a small city, but we had to prove ourselves. Right. You know what I mean? Because people thought it was so way, way out that it, they thought it was country. Mm -hmm. You know, but a lot of people migrated from Watts, Compton, all those areas, you know, in the early 70s. So Pomona was a, a melting pot of different surrounding cities that came to migrate out there. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful place, man. You know, we really had something to prove, like I said, because we were getting dogged out, but we was a small name. But at the same time, for years, we was murder capital, mm -hmm. you know, of the state. Yeah. And, you know, not to say that's something to write on the grandma, but it was a lot of things going on. Ice-T used to faithfully come up there to a spot named Grand Central Station. Right. I'm and, um, man, that was that was an incredible moment in hip-hop because it gave me a chance to, to see the New York cats come through just as well as uh, the L.A. cats for Mix Master Spade to mm -hmm. Scotty D doing his thing and Doug Young doing his thing the, right. and Foot rest in peace who had the record pool and Calvin doing his thing. Right. You know it was it was something that was destined to grow, and we had a a, a radio station out there called KSBC. Everybody that your who's who I don't care where you came from they used to come to that radio station. And that really, you know, put us on the map as far as our own identity. Not all the way mm -hmm. until above the law, you know, did their thing. And then next I was coming up under their wing to where we, you know, set up and paved the way for cats like Sugar Free. Right. And cats that are from Pomona. You know what I mean? So we had our identity, but that mixture between South Central because Gomac, you know, was a contributing member of Above the Law. He mm -hmm. was connected to Lay Law. Right. So back then, it was hustling. Right. You know what I mean? It was on a, you know, on a tip. In the streets. Yeah. For real. So <laughs> that was our start. And, you know, Eric gave us, you know, Lay Law as well, gave us an opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, of a lifetime to be able to come to Ruthless with a different aspect. Because, you know, Ruthless was SB Tell. SB12 driven and right, right, right. and together, you know, it Dre was, was one of the coldest because he always used to come up there, you know, as wrecking crew, right? Doing that thing back in '87 in those days, but Eric gave us a chance to come with a different style, different sound, in which particular. we, you know, yeah. we didn't want to just call ourselves P Funk babies. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We we considered our stuff G's at what we do. 
which had cultivated the G-Funk sound. Right. So, you know, back when me and KMG, Chaos, Go Mac, Laylaw, all of us was doing our thing, Hutch, used, he was a master like a young Quincy. He used to come around there, and I would be humming or one of the cats would be humming with some ideas, and he made up ideas too as well. Mm -hmm. But it was amazing how he, he was able to take certain harmonies because of things in music theory that he was already blessed with. I mean, right. he played in bands, so it's not like he didn't know music. He knew the technique of music. Right, right. And um, it created something that we didn't know that it was going to have that major influence on it, you know? So that's what you have with G-Funk, the beginning of gangster rap as well, which we didn't call it gangster rap. Yeah. It was media that did that. Well, that's you know what it's I mean? good you point that out, because in my book, The History of Gangster Rap, I talk about that, and in that particular section, I interviewed MC Ren, DJ Quick, um, Cormega, um, and I basically asked each of them to kind of break it down and you know the media created the term gangster rap because right. it was street reporting it was reality rap the different things and then when it was branded as gangster rap then you know the record companies the media the fans and then of course later the artists embraced it and, and ran with it but you know it's funny yeah. uh cormega said he's never heard a rapper say, I'm about to go create some gangster rap. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you look at Africa, you know, the original name ain't Africa, but they right. ran with it. So it was True. just something that was good for the landscape. It was a lot of gangster shit going on back then, you know. And, and, and that's what it was. And your name, obviously, too, with um, what ended up being your first album, the Who Am I album. Right. Um, that came out on Epic Records, which was a major label. That's the same label that Above the Law was out on at the time. And Ruthless had one of the things that I always thought was genius that Easy e did, as you call him Eric, of course, but he put his artists or his artists ended up on different labels. Right. And, um, you know, because Easy e and N.W.A. were on Priority, and then you guys were both on Epic, yeah, Above the Law. Yeah, Poor, Broken, Lonely, Above right. the Law, and Cocaine. So mm -hmm. that being said... Um, what was it like and what happened and what were the conversations with you, Easy and Epic when they were like, no, you can't beat cocaine? Like, what and how did I mean, it all evolve? When we started off, it was cool. And, he, you know, he landed that deal. He was one of the really first ones from, you know, from Compton. Right. You know, to, to do it like that. And um, we were all stoked. You know, we finished, you know, some of our project and... And then we go into an office, and it's like really like getting the gas face. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like, I don't want to say no name, but Mr. Al Mosako and Kenny, man, let me shut up. <laughs> but at that time, you know, they were like, well, we're scared. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do the cocaine. But Eric and them was pissed. Like, wait a minute. It's NWA. It's above the law. This is cocaine. Right. But still, they weren't having it, you know what I mean? And Eric was, you know, under certain obligations, you know, because he made an agreement with them. They broke bread with them. So we had to ride that out. So a lot of times when when people were going to the record stores, they was like, we look for cocaine. And and everybody was like, what the fuck is this shit? This is who am I? What the, who the fuck is he, right? Right. So with that particular um, situation, that really had a lot of doors shut on me mm -hmm. because of the name cocaine. And we turn it around and spell K-O-K-A-N-E, you know, right. to mean, you know, warning, listening may become addicting. I mean, that's how we spinning off the ruthless thing because it was about controversy. Right. And they, you know, they did good with that controversy. But... It was crazy, man. It, you know, it left a bad taste in everybody's mouth because we wanted to hear, you know, a lot of fans was putting out cocaine. And I would say that was the beginning of a lot, like I said, a lot of things. Radio wouldn't play me, you know. So I had the attitude like, Chuck D, who gives a fuck about a goddamn Grammy or the right. radio? Radio suckers never play yeah, me. Yeah, suckers never play me. Right. But it was good for underground purposes in the street because... You know, I wasn't going to take no for an answer. And, you know, I just wrote it out because music was in my DNA anyway. So I was it was inevitable that I was going to ride that out, and I had to, mm -hmm. you know. But the good thing about it is that when 
you know, NWA invited me on their project and to write Easy's Ten Commandments for the Appetite of Destruction. Right. As well as introduce a character named Sweet Talk. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That that was like my first platinum record. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't have to, you know, feel so down because they weren't playing my shit on the radio. Mm-hmm. And then above, you know, Cole 187, shout out to Cole 187 again. He's seen different varieties of styles that I have, and he said, I want you to do a Rick James, or I want you to do a George Clinton, da 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 And that really was the starting point as far as in rap on the West Coast for, for the feature game. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then later, you know, a year later, you would have Nate Dogg that came through and, of course, Snoop. Yeah. But those those times, man, made me work my ass off, man. Right. Like, because it's like when you get excited about a situation and then you get in the gas face, <laughs> you know what I mean? It puts a bad taste, but, you know, life goes on, man. I took the good with the bad, and I ain't never think about being the most featured artist in hip-hop or right. none of that. Right. I wasn't even thinking like that. It wasn't what did even you... on my mind. And then um, the deal with Epic went away, but then later... You know, easy sign, ruthless through relativity right. and, and red. So right. when you were able to come back out as cocaine, like what? Well, one of the su- significant things that did help me, mm. you know, is a year later when my, my song got n- my first single, Nickel Slick, Slick Digger, right, got put on, and you know, like Unc said, that was that was um, somebody breaking down the political moves mm-hmm. and saying fuck that. You know, so Uncle JP and, and Mr. Hank Cartwell, you know, that was like, wow, you on a death row orientated soundtrack and you got poor, broken, lonely and cocaine. So that really I want to thank you Unc, because that really did set me up for other situations, you know, because mm-hmm. of it was so political because of my name. Right. And then what did you what was the environment? and the situation getting with Relativity to where they were okay with you using the name? Alan Grunblatt was cool. No, oh, that's really all it was? Yeah, he was cool. Everything was cool. Uh, they realized that Epic dropped the ball, because mm-hmm. they did. Right. You know what I mean? And when he signed, you know, it was a good situation for him because he had above the law. We was working on Uncle Sam's Curse. The phenomenal album. Um, <laughs> who else is on the Bone Thugs? Yep. And he had and easy. That was my pivot. Artist. Yeah, easy stuff. So as a that solo. was my pivot. Because the Who Am I, the dynamics of that album sound totally different from Funk Upon the Rhyme. Sonically, yes. It's, it's like we had a just gotten a UFO and took the fuck off. Well, UFO, you I know? wanted one thing before we, we leave that era of your career that uh I always thought was amazing was on there, the posse cut the USC. So yeah. how did I, I know it's I imagine it's through Layla or what have you, but how did that song come about? The the name University of South Central playing off USC being right there and the reality, like what was creating that song? What was that like? Well, that was beautiful because at that time, you know, um, menace to society, you got to factor that in. Mm-hmm. We had an artist by the name of Kilo mm-hmm. who had all over a hoe mm-hmm. and we wanted to spin the wheel something different. And it was just a, like the grand finale on the Above the Law, Living Like Hustlers. That was my grand finale. The last song. I mean, the last song. I mean, mm-hmm. my bad. The grand finale. Was on the DOC. Right. So that was that was something that was, um, you know, we had words. We would always say balling and chronic. You know, that really came from our camp. And USC was just another, you know, subsidiary of that slang. You know what I'm saying? It was. Okay. University of South Central, you know what I'm saying? Bless the 40 ounce with the mega flex. You yeah, know what I mean? got to. Yeah, so it was incredible, man. Incredible ride, man. And that uh, one other quick above the law side note that I always thought was so amazing, and we saw this happening more and more as time went on, but uh, rest in peace to KMG. Yeah. I was at his funeral, thankfully, um, to be able to represent because... You know, I wrote, I would imagine, probably more articles about Above the Law than probably anyone in the history of Above the Law. (laughs) But, you know, being around those guys a lot and spending time with with everybody uh, was amazing. But I also think um, 
you know, rest in peace to KMG, but I, I wanted to get your input understanding the guest speaker or the guest uh, appearance thing, how significant it was, how he would talk on the records in a way that was so different and so distinctive and always was dropping these gems and jewels that, you know, helped accentuate what you guys did. Right. Well, his name was an illustrator right. for a reason. <laughs> you know, that was like our last poets on records, Gil Scott and Ryan, you know. Mm-hmm. They were able, you know, to 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 kind of emulate a Donald Goins book. Mm-hmm. You know, he was a modern day Donald Goins book. Mm-hmm. You know, he talked that talk, you know, from what area we came from. And with the raspy voice that he had, it was just incredible with, with the words and the slang, which how he did his thing that made him the illustrator from the streets of Pomona, not just Pomona, you know, um, just in hip hop in general. Right. He was also an incredible gifted writer and came up with a lot of melodies just as well, mm-hmm. you know, as an architect. We had our our situation called Pim Clinic Gang and Right. He was just incredible. He was a he was a calm person, you know what I'm saying? And but if you get out of line, you know, he's a real hustler. You get out of line, he whoop your ass. Okay. You know. But I really do miss him, mm-hmm. you know, um, all the people that passed, you know, from Eric to the first it was Train, DJ right. Train. You know, it's just surreal, you know what I mean? But the music lived through us forever, and KMG was just incredible, man. Yeah. He had so many memorable lines, but probably my favorite, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. <laughs> oh, yeah, because that's real. And, you know, back when when they were riding around in the paddy wagon, we did revolutionary shit. Stuff mm-hmm. you know, Norman uh, uh, Winters, mm-hmm. I think his name. That yeah, was, he was the, the publicist, publicist yep. back then. I remember um, Norman. Phyllis Pollock was doing a lot of stuff for us yep. at that time, and they were doing something different. Imagine just rolling through L.A. with a paddy wagon. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't do it. They, they they give you B for that right now. Right. But they were able to do something that was. You know, talking about the lifestyle of hustling. Mm-hmm. And there you look at those brothers' influence. I mean, I was telling my peoples the other day, Biggie and and, and Puffy really did like Above the Law. They was Above the Law fans. Right. So before Biggie name was Biggie, we used to call ourselves Notorious Above the Law. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of influence those cats had on the game. Well, the cigarette boats in the videos. Yeah, There's a lot of and, things. and Kev There's said it best, eating chicken like a motherfucker, yeah, rolling with caddy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, you know, uh, things happen. You know, right. shit happens. Mm-hmm. You know, but hypothetically, if if um, things would have went accordingly and certain people didn't pass and all that, above the law would have been just as big as N.W.A., if not bigger. Yeah. Because they were different. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing to take away, of course, against NWA. You know, we were blessed enough to put those cats at a part of helping them go into the Hall of Fame. Right. Because we were writers on there. You right. know what I'm saying? So it's just a trip, man, to see the whole thing. That's why I'm glad that glad you got that book out, man, to re- yeah, really thank you. put a statement on the West Coast. Yeah. That's that's one of the reasons I wanted to do the book. You know, I'm a big fan of Schooly D, so I want to make sure he got his appropriate shine. Uh-huh. But I also, you know, I think as I've detailed throughout my writing and as I put in the book, The History of Gangster Rap, you know, I don't think people appreciate what Above the Law did and what they mean uh-huh. to the legacy of music. And I have a great quote in the book from Yuckmouth. And he basically was telling me from his perspective what Above the Law did that stood out to him so much was sonically N.W.A. was so much like a bomb squad type of sound with the feel and the energy. And then Above the Law came in and slowed everything down. Right. And before we even get into the G-Funk aspect of it, just on living like hustlers and vocally pimping, even before we even got the Black Mafia life, Uh you heard that sonic change happening through what you guys did. And and I blame yeah. that on the DX7. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> DX7. Well, what break it down fuck? for the people that aren't all uh, all the way knowledgeable about that. Well, you know, this, you you had Juno. We was using Juno. Mm-hmm. We was definitely using the Moog and right. the DX7. Those three keyboards right there. 
you know, really introduced the sonic sound from above the law and cocaine. And I think it's important, too, we touched on it earlier, but people forget or don't understand or don't realize that a lot of the greatest rap music, not all, of course, but a lot of the great rap music has some level of live instrumentation in it. Right. You know, from the beginning, if you from the beginning of recorded rap, starting with uh, the second song ever with the uh, Sugar Hill Gang, right. uh, the second song ever reco- released as a song. I mean, there. That's basically the house band, you know, yeah. the Sugar Hill Gang, the Sugar Hill Band, and yeah. you know that continued obviously with, with Curtis Blow, and then the amazing melodies that Larry Smith had with Houdini and others, yeah. and it carried up, you know, and still to today, a lot of okay. people that actually play instruments, you can hear it and it feels different. Yeah, and it's obviously I love sampling and that's phenomenal for what it is, but. Right. You know, when you're able to bring actual musicianship to rap, I think it just adds a, a excellent layer to it. Yeah, it's innovative, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Uh, that's what we incorporated a lot of uh, live instrumentation into right. our music. And we were just like, we didn't think of what we were doing. We just was going on the feeling, you know, instinct. It felt good to you. It must be good for you. Right. You know, so we were doing all those, and we we didn't want to just be SB te- SB twelve, even though that was cool. But Hutch really used, you know, that was Dr. Dre. He mastered that motherfucker to the M D M. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> As he does. <laughs> yeah, he's boy Dre. He's incredible. But see, at the same time, you know, Dr. Dre. You know, shout out to Dr. Dre. He showed a lot of things to Hutch, and Hutch showed a lot of things to Dr. Dre. Yeah. You know, that's the truth. Yeah. You know, and that's what real uh, musicians do. They 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 come with different universes, but it's amazing when they're able to still shop and steal, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know. And speaking of musicians and looking at things from the sonic side and the executive side with Easy E and with Dre and with Hutch, mm-hmm. one of the other. Uh, major significant things and albums that you worked on, of course, was The Last Meal with Snoop. Right. And you were on the overwhelming majority of the album. Right. So when you and Snoop clearly is, we've seen, but I don't think people realized at that time because of his situation with Death Row, how Snoop has also evolved into a great businessman and, you know, being under Master P at the time. Right. The thing I, I wanted to get from you is, working with the Easy e working with the Dr. Dre, and then working with the Snoop, who's more seemingly looked at as an artist as opposed to Easy e was a businessman. Dre is a, really known as a producer first and foremost. Right. And then going to Snoop, who's first and foremost looked at, especially at that time, as a rapper, like working with those three iconic entities, like how does that, how did that change or evolve what you have to do as an artist to be able to bring what you do to the table with these different personalities and these different ways that people work well first of all we're all friends true you know and have known each other i met snoop dogg and at the end of 90 and um you know warren g used to stay well actually me and warren g used to stay with hutch apartment 187 on mount vernon street in colton (laughs) california we used to pick him up from santa Ana. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So he would always talk about dog and slam, you know, dog, saying he's one of the coldest. And I got a homeboy named Nate Dog. As soon as he get out, his, you know, the armed service doing what he's doing, I want to bring them to the table. And this is Warren G bringing them to the table. Right. So when I met Snoop, uh, he came up to the studio. Our studio used to be on La Cienega and Centinella, the Edge recording studio. Shout out to Mark Palladino. Mm-hmm. Um, he came, you know, uh, came to audition. And when we heard him, you know, I, I, I haven't heard nobody freestyle like that since Run. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Snoop was one of the coldest freestylers. And he could still get down. Oh, yeah. He's a little rusty now. But back <laughs> then, you know, when it freestyle, you know, he was he was cold, you know, right. doing his thing. And, you know, when he left out... Um, I told Hutch, I said, man, dude, cold. Mm-hmm. So actually, Hutch was going to put out, put him on first. Yeah. You know, but during that time, you know, we were all the sacrificial lambs, to tell you the r- truth. 
Right. It was somebody else. You know what I mean? It was, it was other powers that were involved at that time, from Shug to different other situations. You know, he was the he was the good guy of the game. Not saying Suge wasn't, but during that time, it was a lot of poison going around. The right. differences at Ruthless and the creating of Death Row, you know. We were actually going to sign the Death Row, but mm-hmm. I remember like as yesterday, we backed out a deal because we rekindled our business relationship with Easy. I mean, we were all hot. Right. We are about to leave, man. So Easy had called a meeting and called Dr. Dre to come to the meeting that he never did come to. And that was on La Cienega and Centinella. Mm. You know, so going back to the question of what you said, I've been knowing Snoop for a long time, Dre. And when all those different things, you know, started t- to subside, because there's a lot of going on from Eric passing to, you know, to things, you know, being investigated, da 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 da. Right. It was a perfect season for us to go back to 1990. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So one of the cats that he worked with is is a guy by the name of Half Dead. And I was with these cats from Pomino Block Crip by the name of L.A. and Hat. You know what I mean? And that's where me and Trey D did a lot of things because we did a record prior to the doghouse called Breakout. Mm-hmm. And Half Dead always used to come to the studio on Upland and Snoop lived down the street in Claremont. Right. So he sent the kite. Um, I'll tell you a funny story real quick. I uh, go pick up um, in a Celica. I go pick up Half Dead. And he was like, we going over my cousin's house. You know, Nate dog. And I was already cool. I'm like, I ain't tripping. They ain't tripping. So when we pull up, Nate dog opened the door. It was like... You know, he said, this would have, what you call, told me, you know, after he came back to the car, half dead. He was like, what the fuck is that nigga doing over here? (laughs) This is real talk. Right. But we started talking, me and Nate, and we also rekindled things that we were friends long time ago. And he really, you know, we were all like, wow, well, let's put some things together. So when I came over to Doghouse Situation, it was just like magic. It was like he was calling me uh, in Rancho Cucamonga again in 1990. Okay. You know, we used to chop it up and all that. And he said I wanted to start a group, a label. You know, this is, I'm about to leave No Limit. Right. And I've always loved and enjoyed your style of music and your sound, cocaine. You're different. I fucks with you. So that started our relationship again. Mm. You know, and then he, you know, he had Goldie Loke, he had Trey D, and we was at the Music Grinder, and between the Music Grinder and Claremont Studio, you know, a lot of magic happened. And we just knew it fit more than the OJ glove. It was right. Yeah. You know, so that started a whole good thing going on, man, because at that time, man, Doghouse was in in 99 and 2000, we could we couldn't go nowhere without people was like on it. It really hit the culture hard. Yeah, the East Siders, Doggies and Angels. Th- that record would exhibit. Oh yeah. no, man, no, no. Yeah. And then B please. I didn't know <laughs> I didn't know Dog was going to put me on so many songs because we were just working. You had Fred Reg there, you had Jelly Roll there, you had Battle Cat, Pool came through on some things. Just a lot of good stuff. Sky Storage that came through on some things. Mm -hmm. So it was an explosion of all those different, you know, talents in one room. Right. You know, and if you look at the Eastsiders, uh, look at Deuces and Trays, look at Last Meal, Doggies, Angels. I mean, we had the game on lock back then, you know. And it was beautiful because it allowed me to finally, you know, have people knock down the walls of division with my name, mm. you know, and it put me in a different atmosphere once I got on, you know, those records and also L.A. niggas. Right. So I'm very grateful for all those moments. Yeah, that's big. Being on a, a Dr. Dre album is always a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it was my second time, man. Yeah. Like, it was good, man. You mm-hmm. know, you, you, you get in a position to work hard, and that's what it is, man. 
you know? Well, the beautiful thing is that, you know, those records, you know, were around the turn of the century, but the great thing is that you've continued releasing so much music and you've been doing, you know, work that I think is on par with what you were doing back then. It hasn't fallen off in the quality, which is a, a testament to your skill and to your evolution as an artist. So congratulations on that. But, I appreciate that. Yeah, because we had, uh, when we had Open Bar Radio exhibit and I had you on there for the King of G-Funk album uh -huh. and Plastic Surgery is one of our favorite tracks off of that uh -huh. that we had picked and loved that one and, and gave that a lot of burn. And then uh, now you got new stuff coming out with the I'm So Hood. Yeah. And so, single. so break down like 2019, what does the I'm So Hood record mean to you as you look at your career? Well, it's a part of my, my new project, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things come full circle. Not sometimes. Most of the time. Most of the time. So I wanted to go back to the essence of analog plug in. Mm -hmm. um, really talk about relationships, you know, player shit, social conscious messages, messages, songs, and different other things that we do as far as G-Funk is concerned. And... I didn't want to get into a bunch of features because I done done a lot of features, so to speak. I wanted to get back into the authenticity of artistry. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to be, you know, I don't, I, I, I felt like I don't need a bunch of people to sell my records or to, you know, be dope. So that's what we did with this particular album, Finger Roll, uh, produced by a cat by the name of West Coast Stone. Mm -hmm. Very incredible, very underrated. And I'm So Hood is just, you know, it's complimentary to a Renee and Angela song. And it's just a beautiful thing, man. I think, I think, you know, everything has a season. And the season for that type of genre of music, you know, that really has sub substance, in my humble opinion, it's really back on, on, on coming back where it needs to be. Okay. And I wanted to go back. The, the project is called Finger Roll. It's dropping 3.30, uh, mm -hmm. coming up soon. And I'm So Hood is just, it's a subsidiary of what you're about to hear. Okay. You know, you're about to hear some incredible, incredible stuff. And I think, you know, you want to be able to show your growth and your maturity mm -hmm. because I'm at a different place right now in my life. So I've always been a writer to tell life stories through testimony and personal things that I've been through. Right. And I think that makes the greatest records because at the end of the day, it's real. Well, I think, too, that's, for me especially, that's one thing that always drew me to rap was the personal touch that the artist had. Right. And obviously I didn't grow up living that type of lifestyle that a lot of people talked about, but I could relate to a lot of the, you know, the, the feeling you know, the, the feelings of being worried or the feelings of being excited or, you know, they're just general feelings that are applied to different situations. And um, I just always thought that was like such a powerful thing that, you know, you guys and others have done so masterfully throughout the years. And, right. you know, I think it's great to do that. And unfortunately, we haven't seen uh, a lot of those things go away. You right. know, the things that, you know, my favorite, I'd say, above the law records, Uncle Sam's Curse, and sadly the things that they detailed on that album and that everybody's been detailing since the 80s in rap, the situations haven't changed, you know? If and, you look at those albums, there's a, they even mentioned Donald Trump. Hmm. So it's not like we didn't know, knew anything in, in a prophetic way. Right. You know, but it's something about what the universe do with, with music and the passion of music. I mean, those records, Uncle Sam's Curse was like a blueprint, a slight blueprint to what's going on today. And look, it, at it bugs me out every time. Even when KMG said, I'm a walking dead man yeah, is what they call it. It gave me goosebumps when they talk about Uncle Sam's Curse and what's going on. And even if people just look at the album cover. Yeah. I mean... That looked like Donald Trump. <laughs> Why you bullshitting? <laughs> Why you bullshitting? Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that's uh, a power, and it speaks to, you know, your legacy, Above the Law's legacy, and why the music still matters to people so much. So, right. you know, I think that's very powerful. And, you know, I think, too, 
what you did in particular of helping bridge, you know, rap before the Sugar Hill Gang when it was just the park jams and, the you know, we'd get the tapes or whatever. I mean, people were singing and harmonizing. Uh But that had, you know, it's gone through different waves and stuff. But, Uh you know, I think that is obviously obviously something that you did, did and do exceptionally well. So, you know, I know we got to wrap up here in a minute, but one other thing is what do you think singing and the way that you did it helped you become the artist that you are today? I, I always pride myself on trying to stand out as opposed to fitting in. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, I wasn't never trying to be, I don't consider myself a singer. I consider a stylist, kind of okay. like Sly and the Family Stone and, mm-hmm. You know, you put them comparison to Luther Vandross and to other situations. It's just different mixtures of stuff. So I've always liked to, hey, I always like to um, incorporate that weird half P-funk singing. Yeah, this harmony might be off, this harmony, but when you tuck, tummy tuck it down, it gives out a different frequency. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it worked for me, you know. Uh, Obviously, it worked for me, you know. This is the same reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. But it was more of a feeling, man. Like, taking all those great records I learned from my forefathers and and forefathers of rap, you know, to to be able to be a one-man band, so to speak. And that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a one-man band. Right. You know. Well, there it is, y'all. That's uh, cocaine. Thank you for coming through, sir. Damn, man. Appreciate it. Make sure. Hey, we got some shirts for him, too, man. He gave us some books. We got Smirk in the building. The new clothing line, Cocaine Escobar, coming soon. Even better. Yeah, so we want to bless you and lace your checks. Yes, yes. Well, there it is. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming through, Cocaine. I'm Soren Baker here on the debut episode of the Soren Baker Show. It's coming worldwide to everybody. And thank you so much, sir. And for people... That heard us talk about these records and Cocaine's legacy as a solo artist and as one of the main collaborators in rap history, man. Please do yourself a favor and go back and listen to these records, man, from the Who Am I all the way up to I'm So Hood, man. It's an amazing journey sonically, thematically, creatively, and just do yourself a favor for that. I'm Soren Baker. I'm Soren Baker. That's Cocaine. We out. Mm -hmm. Soren Baker Show.